My name is Dr. Michelle Cotty, and this is a brief introduction to neurocognitive disorders. The objectives for this module is to identify types of cognitive disorders, to differentiate between delirium and other neurocognitive disorders, and to discuss risk factors for neurocognitive disorders. These are the types of cognitive disorders found in the DSM-5. Delirium, mild neurocognitive disorder, or NCD, or major neurocognitive disorder, which is commonly known as dementia. Although delirium tends to be short-term and reversible, the neurocognitive disorders that are mild may progress to a major disorder. So major disorders are progressive and irreversible. Now, the way they're classified is it would say classified as NCD, so neurocognitive disorder, due to. So it might be due to Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or Huntington's disease. Those are examples. So when we're assessing individuals for neurocognitive disorders, we want to assess for risk factors. These risk factors include physiological changes, including neurological, like Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, metabolic, like hepatic or renal failure, fluid and electrolyte imbalances or nutritional deficiencies, and cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, infections like HIV or AIDS, surgery, or substance use or withdrawal. Of course, there are other risk factors for delirium, and these include older age, multiple comorbidities, severity of disease, polypharmacy, intensive care units, surgery, aphasia, restraint use, or change in client environment. Risk factors for neurocognitive disorder and Alzheimer's disease include advanced age, prior head trauma, cardiovascular disease, lifestyle factors, and there's a very strong genetic link in early onset familial, familial Alzheimer's disease. There are many screening tools that we can use when assessing a patient for a neurocognitive disorder. For delirium, you can use the confusion assessment method or CAM or the Neilon Champagne Confusion Scale. There's a functional dementia scale and this tool helps us assess an individual's ability to perform self-care the extent of memory loss, mood changes, and whether or not this individual is a danger to themselves or others. A mini mental status exam is often used inpatient, and for clients in long-term settings, we use a tool called the Brief Interview for Mental Status, or BIMS. The Functional Assessment Screening Tool is another option, as is the Global Deterioration Scale. Finally, the Blessed Dementia Scale is a screening tool that is based on the interview with a client's family member. Now, there is no laboratory test or diagnostic test that helps diagnose neurocognitive disorders. In fact, a definitive diagnosis cannot be made until autopsy. So testing is done to rule out other pathologies that could be mistaken or a neurocognitive disorder. So here's a list of other diagnostic procedures that may be done to rule out a neurocognitive disorder. Individuals may use defense mechanisms to compensate when they are starting to experience cognitive changes. So both the individual and the family member or family members can refuse to believe that these things are occurring, even when the changes are really obvious to others. If an individual is asked a question and can't remember the event or activity, they make up stories. This is called confabulation. This might seem like lying, but it's actually an unconscious attempt to preserve self-esteem and prevent admitting that they can't remember. And then perseveration is when an individual avoids answering a question and instead repeats phrases or behaviors. And again, it's another unconscious attempt to maintain self-esteem 
when their memory has failed. So it's important when you are working in the hospital to know the difference between delirium and a neurocognitive disorder. So this slide is going to focus on teaching you to differentiate between the two. In delirium, this is rapid over a short period of time, so hours or days. And in, neuro, in a neurocognitive disorder, it's a very gradual deterioration of function, so months or years. So if the onset is fast, hours or days, you want to consider delirium. An individual with delirium may show impairments in memory, judgment, ability to focus, ability to calculate, and this can fluctuate throughout the day. Disorientation, confusion are often worse at night and in the early morning. This individual's level of consciousness is usually altered and can rapidly change. So there are four types of delirium hyperactive with agitation and restlessness, hypoactive with apathy, and the patient could be really quiet, a mixed type of delirium where the individual has both hyper and hypoactive symptoms throughout the day, and unclassified when it doesn't really fit into a category. They may have rapid personality changes, feel restless, anxious, unable to sit still, and fluctuating moods. They may have hallucinations, illusions, and the change in reality can cause fear, panic, and anger. There may be unstable vital signs. So again, this is a medical emergency. And the reason is because the cause of these manifestations could be surgery, impaired respiratory function, drug or alcohol withdrawal, infection, electrolyte imbalance. So we wanna treat the cause. And if we can treat that cause, the outcome is delirium is reversible. So we want to diagnose and treat delirium right away. This is a medical emergency. On the other hand, a neurocognitive disorder is irreversible and progressive. So a person with a neurocognitive disorder, again, it's a gradual deterioration of function over months or years, so the onset is much slower than delirium. The manifestations include impairments in memory, impairments in judgment, speech, um, these individuals may have a hard time recognizing familiar objects like faces of family members. They struggle with executive functioning, movement, and their impairments don't change throughout the day. Their level of consciousness is usually unchanged. Restless and agitation can be common and sundowning can occur. But personality change is gradual and vital signs are stable unless there's another illness. So advanced age is the primary risk factor, but this can be related to Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injuries, Parkinson's disease, or other disorders. And again, it's irreversible and progressive. The best way to manage delirium is to minimize risk factors and early detection. So timing is really important. We need to be good at assessment as nurses. So once we know a patient has delirium, make sure we watch out for falls, wondering, keep the individual close to a nurse's station, provide a room with low stimulation, but we want it to be lit well enough that they can see where they're walking, right? Prevent falls. We want the client 
to be oriented to time. So we want to continue to provide that information when they're confused. Make sure they wear their identification bracelet. Only use strength as a very last resort. Use PRN medication that can help with agitation or anxiety. We always want to provide cognitive support for individuals who are struggling with impaired memory. Clocks, calendars, family photographs, reorient them as necessary. Keep a consistent routine, maintain consistent caregivers if possible. Make sure they have adequate lighting. And for their physical needs, we want to pay attention to what is the cause of delirium. For, indiv but for individuals who are in bed, we want to look for incontinence, check their skin, make sure they're getting enough to eat. Of course, we're going to monitor everybody's vital signs. Look for dilated pupils because sometimes that can be associated with delirium. We want to promote sleep. So at nighttime, we want to make sure that they have a quiet environment that is, helps promote sleep. Look for nonverbal cues of discomfort. Provide um, their glasses or hearing aids if they need them. When we communicate with them, communicate in a calm and reassuring tone. Speak in positively worded phraser, phrases. Don't argue. Don't question hallucinations or delusions. Reinforce reality, orientation of time. Introduce yourself every time you see the individual. Use short, simple sentences. Focus on one thing at a time. Discuss things that are familiar to the individual. We want to break activities down into short time frames. Limit the number of choices when someone's getting dressed or when they're eating. This helps to avoid frustration and confrontation. Make sure we're using their name. So these are some ways that we can offer patient-centered care for individuals with neuro cognitive disorders and delirium. When we're talking about medications, we want to use medications with caution, especially when using them for PRN for agitation or anxiety. Medications can actually be the cause of delirium. So make sure we're focused on treating the underlying disorder. And unfortunately, antipsychotic or anti-anxiety medications may need to be prescribed. Now, in your ATI books, there is a section on medications for neurocognitive disorders that I strongly suggest you review because I've only put a little blip of it here. But there are medications that are taken during the early stages um, the mild to moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease to help slow cognitive deterioration. And then there are medications that slow brain cell death that are used during the moderate to severe stages of Alzheimer's disorders. So you'll need to know what those medications are, contraindications and interactions, and how they should be administered. For example, with or without food at bedtime. So make sure you take a look at that in your ATI book. So other things to consider, when the individuals are preparing for discharge, we wanna make sure that we educate the family and caregivers about the client's illness. So methods of care, how to make the home environment safe. Ask them, are, is the client going to wander in the street if the doors are unlocked? Are they going to remember their address and their name? Does the individual harm others if wandering around? 
So at home, you want the home to be safe. That means no loose rugs, install door locks that can't be easily opened, lock the water heater thermostat and turn water temperatures to a safe level, make sure there's good lighting and handrails on the stairs are secure. We might wanna put the mattress on the floor, remove clutter, secure electrical cords to baseboards and lock up cleaning supplies. Encourage the client and family to get legal counsel regarding advanced directives, guardianship, power of attorney. Caregivers need support also. As their loved ones health decline, this can be really emotionally challenging. So we wanna provide support for the caregivers. I wanna remind them to take one day at a time.